Hi Biodiverse Festival, my name's Francesca and I'm the Founder and Managing Director of Love the Oceans. Uh, we are a marine conservation organisation and today I'm going to talk you through all of our research and the work that we do in Mozambique. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen with you so that you can see uh, the presentation and what I'm talking about. Um, so as I said we're a marine conservation organisation, uh, we're based in Mozambique um, and I introduced to myself i'm the founder um, but our team is very small uh, we're a micro organization so we're based in jangamo which i'm going to tell you the location talk you through the location of where we are in a minute but we're based in jangamo um, i already introduced to myself uh francesca and then we have our um exec director andrea and our community outreach manager pascal uh, we also have Bento and Mario, who are our ocean conservation champions, uh, which I'll talk about later, but they are almost like interns uh, and they're based here as well. Um, and we use research, education and diving to drive action towards a more sustainable future. I'm going to talk you through our mission in a second, but just to explain exactly where we are and the logistics of it. So we're based in southern Mozambique, east coast Africa, uh, southern, yeah, in southern Mozambique, but southern Africa as well, east Africa, so south east Africa. Um, and Inyumban is the southern province of Mozambique. We're based in Jengamo within that. Uh, and we're partnered with the resort, Joe's Pro Dive Centre. This is a drone shot of where we are. Um, so as you can see there's not a lot else uh, in terms of construction along the beach, there's no massive resorts here. When I say we're partnered with a resort it's um, straw huts, <laughs> it's not like fancy five-star resorts um, and we're in a very very rural area uh, and that I will come back to too because quite a lot because that um, has a big impact on the way that we uh, work conservation wise and community conservation wise. Um, so just talking through our mission um, and why we exist. So um, we are based in Jangamo and our mission is to establish a marine protected area here. So a marine protected area offers a lot of protection for different animals. I initially founded the organisation um, to stop the shark fin trade, which is quite prolific here, uh, but changed the mission to establishing a marine protected area as it offers more protection for a range of different animals and habitats. Um, and we can also uh, help the local community like have the marine protected area benefiting the local community community um, which is really important you need humans involved in uh, conservation I'm a very very strong believer in that because humans are usually the cause of the environmental issue so they need to be involved in the solution um, so we're going to achieve the marine protected area through three different steps um, so first of all education uh, change has to come from within so we run education workshops well Pascal runs those education workshops um, and we talk about things like sustainability and conservation and what sustainable fishing looks like um, protect areas what that could look like ecotourism pros and cons why trash in the ocean is bad all of those kind of topics we work with 10 to 13 year olds in the schools and that is a curriculum that's agreed with the elders here which are like the mayors and that supplements the national curriculum um, and we also work with the fishermen as well uh, the active fishermen doing sustainability workshops and that covers the same similar topics obviously with adults so it's a bit more advanced and we also cover things like turtle poaching and why turtle poaching is bad and more around like sustainable fishing obviously because we're working with fishermen and um, so uh, we have this agreed syllabus and we also teach um, swimming as part of our educational outreach um, so that's basically um, because there's very few people know how to swim here around 95 percent of people don't know how to swim and there's such a fear of the oceans uh, which is such a major problem for ocean conservation because people don't want to conserve something that they're terrified of uh, so we also teach swimming to enable people to enjoy the sea safely and hopefully inspire that passion for conservation um, so I'm going to talk through all of these areas in a bit more depth in a minute. Uh, we also have our research areas. So we do humpback whale research uh, and megafauna research as financial incentives in the marine protected area. We do uh, fisheries research and we do ocean trash research and we do coral reef research. Um, so all of the areas of research that we are collecting, uh, all of that is used to inform legislation change. So that can be the establishment of the marine protected area as a whole, but also uh, changing the types the methods of fishing here and what's legal and what's not um, minimum landing size things like that 
Um, so the fishermen have the pull factor of the education, wanting to change their ways, and the push factor of the research, um, meaning legislation change, so having to change their ways. You've then got to provide a financially feasible way for people to live more sustainably. So a lot of our work is about identifying barriers that can stand in people's way of living more sustainably and then working with people to remove those. So sometimes they're financial barriers. Um, they can also be uh, skills barriers, um, which is a big barrier in this area. Um, so education uh, level is low. People leave school around the age of 13. Um, and as we already discussed, most uh, people can't swim here. So um, identifying those barriers like not being able to swim and then helping people remove them, teaching swimming, um, helps people live more sustainably. Uh, and that this is also kind of rolls into, you know, on the financial side of things, alternative livelihoods. So we have a whole section of our organization develops alternative livelihoods, um, which supplement income, which alleviates poverty, but it also means that there's less pressure on the oceans because people aren't so reliant on the oceans as a protein source uh, if they have another source of income. So that can be aquaponics, it can be agriculture, sustainable honey harvesting, um, jobs in ecotourism, um, all of those kind of things too. Um, so just to talk you through each section, um, so our fisheries research, the question that we're asking is in the top right or well, what that answering is in the top right corner of each slide. So I'll just move myself down. Um, and uh, for our fisheries research, we, ha we do do the shark fisheries research, which I mentioned before, looking at shark fin trade and how extensive it is here. But we also do um, research on everything that's caught. And with that, we're looking at the type of fishing as well and which fishing type of fishing is most sustainable. Um, all of this research, as I said, is used for legislation change, but it's also used to develop community projects and take action around damaging methods of fishing. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute because that we have a project at the moment which, which combines our fisheries research and our coral reef research as well as our community outreach. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, but this research is really important to be able to make those kind of decisions and make the right decisions for the environment. Um, so then we have our coral reef surveys. Uh, so our coral reef surveys, we're partnered with Leeds University in the UK um, and we have a five year uh, strategy for collecting data on reefs on a permanent plot uh, but we also uh, collect data and have been over the last six years on um, coral reef health and abundance and biodiversity of reef of the reef itself but also of associated species cryptic and non-cryptic um, so with this what we're looking at is basically um, the yeah the, the a basic analysis of the health of the reef we're the only NGO working in this area uh, there's literally no other charities or NGOs in Changamo. Uh, and so we don't have any like baseline data to go off. We don't know what's happened historically in the area. Okay, there's some availability of satellite data, but I mean, there's no historic data set here. So we're building one. Um, so a lot of our work is understanding what the problem is before we can go any further because um, there's no point in making rash decisions and jumping in and changing things too soon when you don't know what you're doing. So with our, the reason that this data set and our fisheries data set have come together for a sustainable fishing project um, is because our fisheries data set tells us what fish are being caught and through what method. So for instance, we know that sharks are caught for, um, through long lining um, and we know that nets are really unselective and can catch like mantas and dolphins and sharks and even a baby humpback whale a few weeks ago. Um, and our coral reef surveys are obviously telling us what is alive in situ on the reef. So our reef surveys have shown that we have quite a large imbalance between herbivores and carnivores. Uh, we're really lacking large herbivores on our reefs. And herbivores are, are really, really important because they are responsible for maintaining reef health. So they graze on coral competing algae and without the herbivores the algae takes over and the corals can die off and obviously corals are super important for nursery grounds for all fish so you end up with basically a cascade effect and a collapse in fish stocks here ultimately harming humans um, and our fisheries research allows us to look at the fishing pressure and why that imbalance could be so there's a couple of reasons it could be um, fishing sharks and removing the apex predator means that populations of the carnivores are booming which overgraze on the herbivores 
or we think this is more likely, especially based off the fisheries data that we have, um, there's been a selective fishing pressure on local reefs. So um, netting and spear fishing both happen on very local reefs. So um, nets are usually swum out uh, and that means you're limited by currents um, on how far you can swim that net out. And usually it's not swung out very far at all because obviously the deeper you get, the stronger the current is, the more likely you're, you're, you are to lose the net. And then spear fishing as well, you're limited um, by distance you can swim. And as we discussed, a lot of people aren't strong swimmers here. So um, there's been a lot of fishing pressure on very local reefs. So within a kilometre really from shore. Uh, and the fish that hang out on those reefs are generally herbivorous. So we found that there's a selective fishing pressure on her herbivore fish. Um, so by being able to offer the opportunity for fishermen to use a different type of fishing method, like kayaking, which enables you to get past the breakers, get further out to sea, fish pole in line and target pelagic carnivorous fish like your tuna and your cooter and your wahoos and barracuda and things like that that are much more sustainable and we can address that imbalance. So using the coral reef research with the fisheries research allows us to make um, changes uh, or like well form projects with the uh, fishing community here to address environmental issues. So our sustainable fishing project is in conjunction with um, the Ginjata fishing community and the fishing chief and involves a lot of sustainability workshops but it also involves fundraising and securing equipment like kayaking equipment um, to be able to offer the opportunity for people to fish more sustainably and the fishermen switch out their other methods of fishing so that's netting um, or spear fishing or whatever and they kayak instead so you're transitioning through to a more sustainable way of fishing um, then we have our megafauna surveys. So we're really lucky here. We have all of the sexy species of megafauna. So we have whale sharks, we have manta rays, and we have humpback whales. So with all of them, we're collecting identification data, trying to build an idea of the population here. That means that we can use this as a financial incentive for the government to establish a marine protected area because we can confidently say that we have X many of whichever species and obviously people travel all over the world to dive with these amazing animals. Um, so uh, it's basically a guarantee uh, of source of income uh, for the local community and the government and increase in tourism. Uh, so that's really important data we're collecting there too. And we also collect bioacoustics data on the humpback whales. We work with a lot of different NGOs around Southern Africa. Um, so we're looking at song evolution um, there uh, and essentially the viability of this area as an ecotourism hotspot, which our research is showing very feasible because during um, whale season there are so many whales, it's unreal. Uh, like you, sometimes in the mornings you can't move the boat that much because there are so many whales um, and they're sleeping. So yeah, um, this is another key area of our research. Um, and also our bioacoustics research allows us to assess noise pollution in the area too. Uh, then our ocean trash stuff. So um, this started as, our, as just beach cleaning as you do, uh, hopefully as environmentally responsible people do. Um, so beach cleaning and then this turned into a, okay, we're getting all this um, trash, we need to log it. And then from there it turned into, okay, we know what types of trash we're getting, what can we actually do about this? Um, so this basically has now turned into a trash management scheme as well as basic research. So again, action being taken from the science. Um, so uh, we, what we can do is build uh, what we call eco bricks. Um, so it's basically two litre bottles which are thrown out by the resorts here and um, we collect the trash, we log it all, then we cut it up and we clean it and we pack it and we dry it and we pack it into these bricks and those bricks can then be used in um, local construction projects. Uh, so this scheme has been very successful, we've used over 150 bricks in local construction projects last year alone. Obviously this year has been a bit different with Covid and we haven't been able to do any because we're not allowed, we have Mozambique's been in lockdown since March and you're not allowed to employ construction workers for the majority of that. Um, and I haven't been able to physically get out myself and do all of the, the data and trash management that we would like to do. Um, 
but nonetheless uh, this is another very important area of research and we're always looking to expand projects so next year we're looking at expanding our ocean trash research into water column ocean trash research and relating that back to our filter feeders um, and then our teaching and painting so this is our educational outreach that i mentioned earlier um, so basically with the educational outreach we work with 10 to 13 year olds and we work with adults too um, so um, we part of our deal with the local community is that um, uh, we will also help construct classrooms so the local government agreed that if we could um, get each of the schools that we work at we work at two schools Ginjata and Pindani if we can get each of those schools up to 10 classrooms each then the government would uh, make the third school in the area which has already got 10 classrooms into the first ever high school one of uh, Ginjata or Pindani into the first the whole secondary school for the whole area and then the other one as the primary school for the whole area so the creation of the high of the high school means that that's education up to the age of 18 for everyone in the area, which has never happened before. So it's really, really, really exciting. Um, and it also, our construction work and commitment to maintenance of the classrooms means that schools have been able to stop charging parents for kids to go. So we've essentially sponsored 1,500 kids free education. There's about um, 900 kids at Pandani school and about 600 at Kinjata, which I know I said we're getting each school up to 10 classrooms. So obviously um, resources are lacking hugely in the education space in this area. And that's something that we're working on. Um, obviously with education levels increasing, you get decreased poverty and with decreased poverty, you get increased conservation. People have the financial luxury um, to think more about conservation uh, so poverty alleviation and uh, successful conservation strategies are intrinsically linked so um, whenever you think of conservation you also need to think of the human population in the area that you're thinking of and how they're dealing with things um, so yeah we work with the active fishermen as well running sustainability workshops too um, and then our swimming lessons uh, as well we run uh, on weekends and we have um, intensive swimming lessons in August holidays which is winter holidays here we have two weeks off and we teach um, the kids all day every day about 200 kids over two weeks um, a zero to hero course on swimming so this is aimed at reducing fear in the ocean it's also aimed at reducing drowning so we've had 13 drownings over the last two years in this area um, so we're trying to reduce that and in our lessons part of our syllabus is talking about riptides and water safety so this ties into this quite nicely so we're partnered with swim tiger which is a charity and um, zogs and sta sta like the qualifying board for swimming qualifications in the uk um, and they sponsor us qualifications for out here too um, and this is the first ever swimming initiative in the area all of our work is the first time it's ever been done um, which is exciting and daunting in equal measures um, so we do teach some adult swimming lessons especially with the fishermen as well um, because obviously if people are spearfishing things like that they need to be able to swim safely um, but we do predominantly teach four to 18 year olds uh, quite often. Obviously with COVID things have changed a little bit and we don't know what this will look like going forward. We imagine it will probably be a socially distanced version of swimming. But luckily we've managed to secure money, enough money to build a community pool. And before this photo is in a um, resort pool, which we're in incredibly grateful that they let us use the pool free of charge. But um, having you, ha you have to drive quite a long way and you have to pack the kids on a truck and I can only fit 40 kids on a truck with me. Um, so by being able to build a pool in the community, it means that kids can actually walk to the lessons themselves. We can get through a lot more kids, but we can also do socially distanced lessons and not worry so much about um, lots of kids together in the pool. Um, so just a quick one on our impact so far. Um, I'm not conscious that I've spoken for 20 minutes already. Um, so this is just basically talking about what we've done. So I founded organ um, the organization in November 2014, and then we started working properly on the ground in 2015. So we've been working for about five seasons. Um, and this is just our impact that we've had. So over 1,150 kids have been taught the basics about the oceans. 14 more classrooms are available to teach in. 
uh, and that, as I said previously, that means that the first ever high school in the area can be established. We're working on that with the government at the moment around teacher allocation and logistics for that. And um, over 1,500 kids have access to free education now, uh, and there's been a large financial injection into the local economy. So the construction of the classrooms we employ local builders for, and we fundraise for that internationally. So that money has gone directly into job creation in the area. Our whale research, so we're in the middle of publishing a paper on cultural transmission through vocalizations around Southern Africa and also song evolution of humpback whales. Um, and this allows us to study pods, uh, and really in here it should be megafauna as well. Um, so we've started an adopt a whale shark scheme, we've ID'd lots of whale sharks in the area and we're beginning to understand the populations of whale sharks, manta rays and humpback whales a lot more here. We are also just about to expand into dolphin research in conjunction with um, a research centre further down south in Mozambique too. Um, so watch the space for that if you like dolphins. Um, our fisheries research, so we've got over six years of seasonal fisheries data. Um, it's the longest data set on fisheries in Mozambique that we know of. Um, we have launched our sustainable fishing project, which I've told you about already. Um, and the fishermen have also completely given up gill netting courtesy of our work um, and our sustainability workshops and this sustainable fishing project. So um, working with the fishermen is so integral in uh, conservation. Um, and the fishermen also voluntarily take part in our sustainability workshops, which is obviously really nice that everyone can work together. Um, so our ocean trash stuff, we've removed over a ton of trash from the beaches and we've begun assessments on what that is. We've also removed large ghost nets and as I said before, over 150 bricks, eco bricks have been used in local construction projects. Um, our coral reef research, uh, we're partnered with Leeds and that project is underway. It's a five year project and that has also the potential, depending on the results, for a coral propagation project, like a coral gardening project afterwards as well. Um, so yeah, lots of future potential there. And the coral reef research, as I discussed before, with the fisheries research has um, informed our sustainable fishing project and local government and all kinds of stuff. Um, then our swimming lessons, over 800 kids have attended our swimming lessons and we've qualified the first ever Mozambique STA swimming instructor and six STA aquatic helpers too. And we've also managed to raise enough money for our community pool. So I think the next slide is actually, yeah, talking about that a bit more. So we were very lucky. Um, last year we were recognised as a uh, one of 15 global grassroots forces for change by Megan and Harry. And Megan donated uh, a lot of money to our community um, fundraiser to build the community pool. We haven't been able to actually build that yet um, because of COVID, <laughs> uh, but we are hopeful that we'll be able to build that early next year. What we don't want to do is, um, first of all, if we built it, there would have been a possible, well, not really, maybe an opportunity to have built it pre-COVID and rushed it all through, but it would have burnt a hole in our pocket with no one actually being able to use it because um, Mozambique went into lockdown. And obviously with COVID, we don't know what's happening with, you know, second waves and things. So we're waiting for things to settle down a bit and until we can actually legally do swimming lessons. Um, so we are yeah, waiting for that to happen. Um, and also we work with Mission Blue, um, which is Sylvia Earle's organisation and Sylvia Earle's personally backed her project. So this kind of media attention, um, if you're interested in the NGO space, you can shoot me a message. But this kind of media attention is really important to securing sponsors going forward building Instagram followers which again is important for securing sponsors whether that be equipment or financial business commercial all of that kind of stuff um, and it's obviously just lends you legitimacy as well um, in terms of the actual data that we collect um, so with our fisheries data we collect uh, species sex IDs, pre cordal fork, total length, all the different types of lengths, weights, locations. Um, we also collect vertebrae because with sharks, if you collect shark vertebrae, you can actually age the shark using the shark vertebrae. It is similar to cutting down a tree and seeing the growth rings. Obviously, we're not fishing those animals ourselves. That's opportunistic sampling. So when sharks or any other kind of animal are caught in local fisheries, that's the data that we're collecting. As I mentioned with our coral reef research, we're looking at coral coverage and we're also looking at associated reef species. Um, we're expanding next year into nudibranchs a bit more as well, little sea slugs. Um, and we keep all of that 
footage it's all filmed on gopros so that we can go back and reuse it if we want to and re-log um, for instance with like indicator species um, then our megafauna as i said we're looking at identification so that's photo ids sighting behavior that kind of thing then we're also looking at um, vocalizations and location all the normal stuff as well uh, then our ocean trash, we're looking at composition, type, weight, um, brands as well that are involved. We do a lot of um, naming and shaming on our social media. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the normal culprits for ocean trash stuff. Um, washing up on the beaches, I think it's the same, uh, same companies all over the world, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, so that's what we're looking at. And plastic type, which you can tell by the triangle that you get on the bottom of plastic bottles and plastic items. Is a triangle with a number in the middle, um, triangle of arrows, and that will tell you the type of plastic, um, which is just interesting to note. So if you'd like to get involved in what we do, um, we're always looking for supporters. So you can volunteer. We take um, people out here. So everything that I've talked about, obviously we're a tiny organisation, so I, like myself, Andrew and Pascal, couldn't do all of that on our own. Um, so we are relying on volunteers to come out and help us. So please do get in contact if you do want to come out and help. Um, and you can also donate. So lovetheoceans.org forward slash donate. You can um, donate or, or if you run a business, you can partner with us. That can be corporate sponsorship or commercial. It doesn't matter. Um, you can also adopt a whale shark, which is a fun thing for um, birthdays or presents. But it really, really helps our research because um, it allows us to get like new equipment for the whale shark research, like a camera <laughs> um, and allows us to function. Uh, you can fundraise uh, if you'd like to do that you can get you can get in contact with me and i'll help you you can buy merchandise so you can go on our t-mail store um, which is lovetheoceans.tmail.com and you can buy some ocean themed merchandise um, and we'll also be having a christmas jumper coming out soon so keep an eye out for that if you'd like a marine themed christmas jumper um, and you can also become an ambassador for us a student ambassador um, and do talks at different um uh events fairs uh universities schools all of that kind of stuff so do reach out if you're interested in that um and then yeah that's so um if you can follow us on social media we'd really appreciate it we are trying to build our presence so that we can secure better funding and things like that um i'm just gonna stop the sharing now yeah so um you can reach us on our website which is lovetheoceans.org our instagram facebook twitter youtube that's all at love the oceans so you can reach us there um and uh yeah we're, we're running a q a series at the moment with some really interesting guests so if you want to hear from other conservationists as well and ask your own questions then you can through that series too um so thank you for watching and please drop any questions that you have in the comments um or shoot us a you can just message us on instagram um, with any messages uh, questions that you have too awesome thank you